Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. This is our last lesson in our study, The Life of Paul the Apostle. This is lesson number 24 concerning Paul's death. We'll begin our study by a reading from Philippians chapter 1. We'll start with the second part of verse 18 and read through 21. Paul said, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. While we know little concerning the actual circumstances of Paul's death, the event leaves us with some particular food for thought. When one of Paul's stature dies, it's a great event, if for no other reason than the loss of his influence for good. His death left a vacuum that could not easily be filled. In fact, the world has never found another like him to take his place. Tradition holds that Paul was tried before Caesar a second time and then beheaded. His circumstances render this as probable due to his Roman citizenship. We know under their laws he could not be tortured or crucified. It is also probable that he was executed outside the city limits of Rome to avoid undue attention within the city. However, there is no reliable evidence concerning any of this, and even we have no idea how his body was disposed of. We know none of his dying words. We have no knowledge of who attended his funeral or if he even had one, and this should not surprise us as Paul had always emphasized his feelings concerning the lives of the believers, not their deathbed expressions. Yet, for Paul to die would be gain, he said in Philippians 1.21. He meant it would be an advantage to himself based on the facts of the very religion that he taught. In this sense, it would be an advantage for any Christian to die, because his eternal circumstances would be so much better than his earthly ones. This would even hold true for the richest Christian, as well as the most downtrodden. Heaven is a better, happier place than this world could ever, ever be. With those thoughts in mind, let's begin our discussion of, of this lesson. First, we want to talk Paul's, about Paul's immeasurable influence. His influence on this world cannot be measured. While every great man has left his mark, some could have taken their place. However, no one could have replaced Paul. His conversion to Christianity accounts for much, if not all, of the influence he has had on successive generations. What are some of these characteristics of Paul that caused him to be able to wield such an influence? What are some of the traits that made him the right man for the job of taking Christianity into the Gentile world? I have five things written down here. We'll take a look at, at those. And then I have three more things that more specifically let us examine his religious characteristics. Paul was a profound thinker. He had the ability to reason from the scriptures. He was eloquent, not in his manner of speech or his voice, but in the message that he delivered. We know he was not an eloquent uh, speaker. He admits that himself. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 3 and 4. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
And then over in Second Second Corinthians, uh, chapter what ten? Yep, yeah, chapter ten and verse ten. For they say, people say about Paul, Paul's talking about his detractors, they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Well, Paul didn't disagree with this, but he admitted that his presence was still important, even though he was not a great speaker or a, perhaps not a very handsome man. His zealous, he was zealous. No earthly obstacle was insurmountable in his eyes. We saw that even when he was practicing Judaism and he was, he was uh, persecuting the church right and left all over Judea and even tried to take his persecution out of the country up into Syria to Damascus. With that in mind, his actions were always controlled by his conviction of what was right his sense of integrity, and by always taking the high ground. Of course, when he found out his sense of, uh, what, of his conviction of what was right was wrong, he immediately changed and began pursuing Jesus Christ. We do know that his heart was tender and gentle, even to the point of a willingness to sacrifice his own soul to save that of his kinsmen. We have to look in Romans chapter 9 and verse 3 to see this idea. He says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. In other words, he knows he's the apostle sent to the Gentiles. He knows that that is the fertile ground in which he needs to sow the seed. But he is so sad that so many of his Jewish brethren are refusing to convert to Christ. Now let's look at three characteristics uh, that more specifically let us see Paul as a religious man. Yes, he was a profound thinker. Yes, he was eloquent in his message. He was zealous. He was controlled by his conviction of what was right. And his heart was tender and gentle. But let us examine his religious characteristics for just a moment. In his religious principles, he was absorbed, fixed, and immovable. Everything else in his life, whether as a Pharisee or as a Christian, was subordinate to his religion. Secondly, he truly believed that the gospel is for all. In his eyes, there were no longer any human barriers that could not and were not crossed by Christianity. The one God, the one Savior, the one hope, the one faith, and the one baptism belong to all men universally if they would only accept Christ. With regards to his own personal religion, he was humble, earnest, sincere, and prayerful. To him, principle was more powerful than feeling truth more powerful than emotion. He was duty-bound, he was honest, he was sincere, and he possessed integrity. Both his energy and his love knew no bounds. We know Paul was a martyr, not the first martyr, but one of the first. He bore witness and faithful testimony to the truth of the gospel even as he faced death. One commentator said when the time came for him to seal his faith with his blood, he did not refuse to die. Paul's view of the results of his conversion to Christianity were surely broadened by his death. Do you think he regrets his decision to follow Jesus as he awaits the judgment day? Let's take our last reading of, of this study from Colossians, Paul's letter to that church. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 9 and read. Let's read the rest of the chapter. 
Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And here's the clincher. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We must give up all for Christ. It's not an option if we want to follow Christ. If we do, we will never regret it, either here on earth, and especially we won't regret it in the days, in the days to come and further past that into eternity. With Christ on our side, we can withstand poverty, disappointment, persecution, reproach, scorn, and even eventually our death. Three things for further thought. Number one, if to die is gain, then why is suicide not an option to the Christian? You notice that Paul, in some of his writings, says that he is ready to die, but in nowhere in his writings do we see him saying I'm going to take my own life. I'll leave that to you to think more along those lines. Would characteristics describe uh, the characteristics we described as influential have been to Paul's advantage no matter what he chose as his life work? In other words, how do you think he approached his tent making when he had to earn money for it, his own care? How can these characteristics be incorporated into both our secular and religious lives? And finally, compare Paul's religious characteristics to your own. How do you measure up to Paul? How do I measure up to Paul? I certainly use him as a guide and a gauge to how I live my life in Christ. I hope you've enjoyed this study of the life of Paul the Apostle. This lesson brings us to our conclusion. We hope that you will check out some of our other videos we have under different playlists. We have the entire book of Matthew, a study for that book. We have some topical sermons available, also some expository sermons, some 10-minute devotionals, and some odds and ends uh, out there that I couldn't figure out where else to put them and I didn't know how to spell miscellaneous. So if you would go elsewhere on our channel, find some other videos, share them with your friends, give them a like, give them, even give them a dislike if you don't care for, for what's there. Give us a comment. We would appreciate that. The biggest help you can give me, however, is to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and come back and visit with me at every opportunity. Thanks again for watching. Until we meet again, may God bless.